Hi everyone, uh, I'm Jeremy or Exolotl and for the last one and a half years I've been working on a Game Boy Advance game using NIM with a friend of mine. So that's what this talk's going to be about. Um, if you're watching this live and you have any questions just put them in the chat and I'll try and answer them. Uh, otherwise I guess leave a comment and I'll try and get back to you. So first a quick history of how I got to this point. Uh, back when I was like 13, I was really interested in the idea of making homebrew for the Nintendo DS. So I tried teaching myself some C++ and reading some tutorials, but I found that it was really hard to get into, especially because the available documentation and libraries for the Nintendo DS were either really badly made or just too advanced for me to understand at the time. Uh, and then at some point I found out that if you want to get into Nintendo DS development, the best way to start is by learning GBA programming, because the DS is basically a GBA on steroids. Uh, all of the same concepts apply, but there's just more of them and more complexity. Um, it just so happens that there's this really excellent tutorial called Tonk, which can teach you everything you need to know about programming for the GBA. And Tonk also comes with a library written in C called Tonklib, or LibTonk, which is fully documented and has a set of examples to go with it. And it uses all of the same naming conventions and terminology as what you find in the tutorial. So this was exactly what I was missing from the days when I tried to learn DS development. And this is inadvertently how I got good at GBA programming. And then when I was at uni, uh, I was quite comfortable with C, and so I tried um, porting Vlambia's game Super Crate Box to the GBA. Um, I thought that this game would be a really good fit because the game was originally made in the same screen resolution as the GBA, so it should translate over really nicely. Uh, unfortunately, I never finished this, but I'd like to get back to it someday and finish it off. Uh, and then, a couple of years later, I became friends with Rick, uh, also known as Hot Pengu, who is a fantastic artist, and we have uh, a lot of interests in common. Um, and one weekend we had this crazy idea of making a GBA game for Ludum Dare, which is a 48-hour game jam, so you have to make a whole game from scratch in one weekend. Uh, if you're working with a partner, the rules are a little bit more relaxed. Um, you get three days instead of two days, but still, it was it was a huge challenge. I've never coded so intensely in my life as in that one weekend, and somehow we made it, and we were quite proud of the result. So we decided to make a full game out of it, uh, making a, a follow-up with a full cast of characters and storyline and exploration and monsters and basically make the coolest thing that we possibly could out of it. Um, and around this time I'd also been just starting to learn NIM, and I was really impressed with it, and I realised that it can work quite nicely on the GBA, so we decided to make the whole game using NIM. During that time I've been working on a couple of libraries which I've put on GitHub. Uh, Natu is a full set of bindings for LibTonk, uh, plus some nice extras on top, and it basically gives you everything that you need to program for the GBA using NIM. And Trick is an asset conversion library. Essentially, the GBA only accepts graphics in very particular formats, um, so you can use Trick to write desktop tools that will take your PNG files and convert them into the format that makes the GBA hardware happy. So now for a quick overview of the hardware that we're working with here. Uh, we're running a fairly slow by today's standards ARM processor, uh, and I've listed some of the areas of memory that we're interested in. Um, we have uh, internal RAM, which is where all of your variables will go by default, and it's embedded into the CPU, so it's very fast to access but it's easy to run out of it uh, by accident if you make an array that's too big or something. 
you can annotate your variables to choose to move them into external RAM, which does a lot more of, uh, but it's slower to access. So there's a trade-off to be had there. Uh, then you have your video RAM or VRAM, which is uh, where all of your graphical data goes. And then the ROMs themselves can be up to 32 megabytes in size. So you can put a lot of stuff in a GBA game. You're just limited as to how much of it you're allowed to load into memory at any one time. Uh, graphically, uh, this is in general, there's, there's other modes that we can use, but this is the common one that we're tending to use in Good Boy. Uh, you're working with four background layers. So these are basically tile maps that take up the whole screen. Uh, and you can have up to 128 sprites on the screen at any one time. Usually you'll want to be using 4 bits per pixel graphics, which means that you have 32 palettes available, uh, 16 for backgrounds and 16 for sprites, and each palette can have up to 16 colours in it. So why do we want to use NIM to program for the GBA? The first point of this is always going to come down to personal preference to some degree, but I think NIM has a really nice syntax. Uh, it's clean and it gets out of your way, and I think especially features such as named arguments and universal function call syntax, um, they make it possible to write code that cleanly expresses what I meant rather than having to write code that makes the compiler happy. Uh, despite all of this, the language is still low level and produces efficient C code, which means that it's possible to, to use the language anywhere where you already have a C compiler. So it was very easy for me to drop it into the existing toolchain for GBA development and get it working. And this also means that it has great interoperability with existing libraries uh, that are written in C or assembly so we don't have to reinvent the wheel and make our own text rendering engine or music library. Uh, we can use existing solutions for that. And needless to say, NIM's fantastic compile time features come in handy as well. When you're working with such limited hardware as the GBA, being able to offload work to compile time and generate code on the fly is, um, is really valuable. So to get started with GBA development, you'll need to install the DevKit ARM cross-compiler toolchain. Um, the setup for this is a little bit different for each platform, but if you're on Windows, I would recommend to use MSYS2. Uh, this way you can easily build desktop programs and GBA programs from the same terminal, which is really handy. And then once you've installed that, uh, you'll want to use Pac-Man to grab the GBA dev group of packages and you can try to build the examples using the make files that are provided and make sure that they work for you. Then on the NIM side, we can use Nimble to install Natu and Trick. And so we can try out some of the examples that are included in Natu. Uh, these examples are using NIMScript tasks uh, to, for the build process. And so this means there's just one command that you have to run to compile your game and fix up the ROM and stuff. And then you can run the ROM in an emulator of your choice. And then when we're targeting the GBA, there's certain options that we have to pass to the NIM compiler to make sure that it outputs suitable code for the platform. Uh, in particular here, I've disabled the garbage collector uh, and any OS functionality. So that means that we're not allowed to use most of the standard library at runtime. Uh, and we also have to avoid any language features that might allocate behind the scenes, such as NIM strings and sequences and reference types. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that um, ARC, NIM's new memory management strategy, didn't exist when I first started doing this, but I can see it working on the GBA. One of the first ideas that we'll come across when we're developing for the GBA is this concept of memory mapped IO, 
which is essentially a bunch of predetermined memory locations and you can read and write them as a means of directly interacting with the hardware. So the first one of these that we'll look at is the display control register. Um, what this does is change various uh, graphical settings about the GBA and it can be used to turn on and off uh, backgrounds and sprites. So for example, if we wanted to enable background number zero, we would have to set bit eight of the display control register. And the way that we would do that in C is shown here. Essentially, you dereference the memory address OX040 blah blah, um, and you assign to it uh, one shifted across by eight places. Uh, importantly, this has to be marked as a volatile access. Otherwise, we might find that the compiler tries to get clever and optimizes out uh, our code or breaks it in some way that we didn't foresee. And the official way to do this in NIM is using volatile store from the standard library. Uh, but this can be a little bit cumbersome, and so I tend to do it a different way that we'll take a look at in a sec. So in C, the way that you would make this nicer to use is using defines, of course. So here we've defined reg display control, uh, which expands to the dereferencing of the memory address. Uh, and we make defines for all of the various flags that we might want to use with it. Uh, and that means that we can basically treat the display control register as if it was a normal variable, uh, which is it becomes quite pleasant. And this is where NIM's fantastic C interop comes in. libtonk already defines all of these for us, so we can just import them into NIM and use them in our code as if they were normal variables. Ignore the fact that uh, display control here is 32 bits in size. That's just a quirk of the way that Tonk decided to implement it. Uh, particularly, I think the register next to it in memory is unused. So we can get away with using 32-bit access in this one case. And there's a, a chance that it will end up being more performant because uh, we're working with the machine's native integer size in that case. Uh, but I, I think it doesn't matter too much, really. And so now we can start using these variables in NIM, uh, similar to how we were doing in C. So here we assign to the display control register in order to enable background zero. And note that this will clear any previous bits that may have been set in the register. And now say that we decided we want to enable sprites as well. Uh, we presumably don't want to accidentally hide background zero. So th what that means is we need to take the existing value of the display control register and bitwise or it with the flag that's used to enable sprites. Uh, sprites are formally known as objects on the GBA. So that's why the flag is called obj. And when we do that, we typically want to enable another flag as well. Uh, the 1D mapping flag, which determines how the GBA expects the graphics for the sprites to be laid out in memory. And now let's say that we decided we, we do want to hide background zero without disabling sprites. Uh, the way that we would do that is we would take the value of the display control register and bitwise and it with the inversion of the flag that we want to clear. Uh, so this all works, but it's a bit ugly and cumbersome, and it's not really doing anything that we couldn't have already been doing in C. So I found that this can all be improved by using NIM's distinct types feature. What we do is we make a data type, which is specifically for the display control register. Uh, under the hood, it still gets treated as a uint32 in the compiled C code, um, but you're not allowed to mix it with other uint32s, and you have to redefine any operations that you want to be available to it. 
we can import the same register from libtonk, only this time we give it a more friendly name and we use display control as the data type for it. And then we can define some getter and setter templates uh, to read and write the desired flags. And so this is how the code that we previously looked at could now be written using this nice API. We initialize the display control register, enable background zero, enable sprites and 1D mapping, and then disable background zero. Um, but there is a small problem here, which is these are still all volatile accesses. And what that means is that the C compiler is legally not allowed to optimize any of these into a single assignment. We can work around that by using temporary variables. So here we have variables X and Z, which we make all of the desired changes to. And then when we're done, we do the assignment to display control. And I'm fairly confident that the C compiler would then be able to optimize this into the exact same sort of code that we saw before. Um, although this gets pretty cumbersome, of course, you don't want to have to think about making temporary variables all the time whenever you're working with registers. Uh, and so I was able to make a couple of macros, uh, init and edit, which can do the same thing, only hiding away the details and you can call them using either function call syntax or block syntax. You may notice that this is similar to the with macro that was introduced in NIM 1.2. Only here, we're not only using it as syntactic sugar, but also for optimization reasons. Also, in some cases, we might want to construct a register value on the fly uh, in order to pass it to some library function or something like that. And so for that purpose, I made a bunch of init foo macros, uh, which should be fairly familiar if you've uh, already used NIM before. Another nice thing that we can use is this efficient bit sets feature, which I didn't think was a good fit for the entire register as a whole, because there's some cases where you might have to take two or three bits together to form a numerical value. But I was able to apply it to display layers in this case. So here we're using this nice set notation to enable sprites and a couple of backgrounds all at the same time. So now we can take a look at how to write a Hello World program for the GBA. This is what it looks like. First of all, we have to initialize the display control register uh, to enable background zero like we were just looking at. And then we have to initialize Tonk's text engine uh, car 4c here essentially means that we want it to be rendering 4 bits per pixel graphics to one of the tile maps. And we tell it that we want to use background 0, and we pass to it the desired value for the BG control register. Uh, and I'll explain more about that in a sec. Then we have to set the cursor to be roughly in the middle of the screen, and we print out hello world. Uh, and then the final thing to do is to put the machine into an infinite loop. Uh, the reason for that being in the GBA, it's not really defined what it means for a program to end. I guess you could say that the program ends whenever you flip the power switch. But anyway, this infinite loop isn't very good because while the CPU is in here, it's just going to be burning cycles forever and it's going to cause the machine to run out of battery really fast. So the proper way of doing this is using the B blank interrupt, which we have to enable. And this is basically an event that fires once per frame at the moment when the screen has finished updating. Uh, and then within our infinite loop, we can use a BIOS function called B blank interrupt wait, which will put the CPU into a low power mode, basically put it to sleep until until the start of the next V blank. So now we can finally start doing some cool things. Uh, I'm going to show you how to load up a background image onto the GBA, and this is where Trick comes in handy. So we're going to write a small desktop program, which is going to load up our image. Most of the magic is happening in the load BG4 procedure, which 
is going to load up our PNG using the NIMPNG library and then it's going to break it up into 8x8 pixel tiles and hopefully remove any duplicates that may, that may have occurred. And it's also going to produce a tile map and a set of palettes to go with the image. So then we can output this data into raw binary files and we can compile and run our tool as shown below. And then on the GBA side, we can do something really cool. Basically, we use static read to load these files into some constants at compile time. And then the next step is to try and get this data into video memory somehow. This is where the elements of that weird background control register value that I glossed over in the hello world come into play. So there are two destinations that we're interested in here. Uh, one of them is the character block and the other is the screen block. And Tonk uses these terms to try and avoid the confusion that arises when you talk about tiles. Uh, are you talking about the tiles in the map or are you talking about the graphical data for the tiles? So the idea is that a character block is where the image data goes and a screen block is where the map data goes. Uh, and these regions exist in VRAM. Uh, they're overlaid with each other, uh, as Tonk shows here. So that means that if we decided to put our image data in character block zero, then we probably shouldn't be putting our map data in screen blocks zero through to seven, uh, because then we'll end up conflicting and probably overwrite one with the other. Uh, so let's choose to put the image data in character block zero. And just to be sure, we'll choose screen block 31 for the map data. Uh, so now that we've decided on that, we can use these efficient memcopy functions provided by Tonk to transfer the data from ROM into the appropriate places in memory. Uh, the slightly awkward thing about this, though, is that uh, these string constants are going to be embedded inline into the function calls in the generated C code. Um, which feels slightly gross, but fortunately we can rely on the C compiler to eliminate any duplicate occurrences of the data that might happen if we were using the same constants in other places. Um, but probably the, the more correct way to do this would be instead of outputting raw binary files uh, to output C code that contains the data that you want, and then you could import that data into NIM and use it that way. But this approach is convenient and it works nicely for this simple example. And then finally, we need to initialize the background control register, which was being done for us already in the hello world example, but here we have to do it manually. So we tell it which character block and which screen block we're using. And of course, we need to actually enable BG0 using the display control register, as we've already seen a thousand times before. And then, of course, we need our infinite loop to keep the game running. So putting all that together, you should see something like this. Uh, it works, but it's a little bit off center. The reason for that being that a single screen block's worth of tile data is bigger than the size of a GBA screen. But there is a way to fix this. Uh, and the solution is using more registers, of course. Fortunately, libtonk already provides quite a nice interface for working with these. I've just imported and renamed them to make them a bit friendlier. So instead of having eight registers, we have an array of four points, uh, one element for each background. So you can see at the bottom how we can assign the X and Y offsets to background zero. And so this fixes our problem. Now we've got it nice and central. Uh, so I guess the next thing that we could try is making it scroll horizontally over time. And so you might think that the way to do that would be something like this. So here, uh, inside the loop, we're using plus equals one to ideally increment the horizontal scroll value of background zero every frame. But unfortunately, this isn't going to work because the hardware imposes a restriction on us, which is that the BG scroll registers are write only. 
So this compound assignment isn't going to work. What it's going to try to do is read the horizontal scroll value, add one to it, and then write it back to the register. But the first of those steps is just going to give us garbage. I was able to mitigate this somewhat to prevent people from doing this, uh, again using distinct types. And in this case, the setter is defined. But if you try to use the getter, it's going to give you this nice compile time error that tells you what you did wrong. Um, unfortunately, this isn't totally foolproof, but it catches some of the common misuses. Anyway, the correct way to scroll the background over time is just to use a variable. Uh, I'm going to call this one camera because I think that more accurately reflects uh, how the background scroll registers work. If you increase the x value, it moves the background to the left, so it does behave more like a camera. Uh, so we increase the camera.x in the loop and then assign that to bg offset 0. And since that's only a write operation, we're allowed to do that. So here's our code in action. And now that we've covered backgrounds and scrolling, uh, I can move on to possibly the coolest part of the talk. But rather than explaining in advance what I'm going to do, uh, I'm just going to do it and you'll have to follow along. A limitation of the GBA hardware is that it doesn't have a floating point unit, uh, nor does it have a division operation. And the processor is almost certainly not powerful enough to want to be thinking about generating a sine curve at runtime. Uh, so what we're going to do here is use a static block to create a sign lookup table at compile time. And within that block, we're allowed to use math functions from the standard library and do any floating point operations that we want. And then we have to make sure that the result is an array of integers. Uh, and so six is an amplitude that I chose here to make sure that the output is suitable for my purposes. And now at runtime, we define an array of 160 points. Uh, 160 happens to be the height of the GBA display in pixels. Uh, and for each of those points, we choose a differing x value based on our sign lookup table. Uh, and we use the same fixed y value as before. And finally, we're going to use a feature of the hardware called direct memory access which what that does is it halts the CPU and copies data from one location to another uh, at a time when we specify. And the way that we've configured it here is to fire on every H blank. H blank is an interval during which the display has finished rendering one scan line of pixels, but before it begins rendering the next scan line, uh, so there's this very small window of time during which we can perform copies. And we tell it to assign to the BG offset registers for background zero. And we tell it to start at the first element in our points array. And every time it performs a copy to move along that array by one. And the result of that can be seen here. Essentially what we've done is to scroll the background by a different amount on a per scanline basis using the values from our sign table. And then we can simply introduce a timer that ticks up by one every frame and recalculate our points array, uh, making sure to include that timer in the lookup and then perform our DMA copy as we were doing before. And the result of this is to completely bring the background to life by making it look like it's underwater or something, uh, simply by changing the amount that each scanline is offset by uh, over time. This technique was also used in a lot of commercial games too, and we're using it in Good Boy Galaxy to produce these gorgeous parallax scrolling backgrounds using only a single image. So that's the main example that I wanted to show off in this talk. Uh, I'm going to quickly go over a few other things that you'll frequently be coming across in GBA development. Uh, so we didn't get to talk about sprites much yet, uh, but they exist. Uh, they are small moving objects that you can position on the screen. 
And similar to I.O. registers, I've been able to make a fairly nice interface to sprites as well. In Good Boy, we were able to innovate on this even further by having it so that when you set up a sprite, you tell it what graphic you're using, where the graphic is defined in a config file somewhere. Uh, and then at compile time, the game is able to know uh, a lot of things that you would previously have had to manually put in by hand, such as what size is the sprite uh, and what bits per pixel is it using. Um, and so this is able to eliminate a, a lot of human error that would previously have been a big pain for us. Unfortunately, this code is still quite game specific, so I haven't found a nice way to make it reusable for other people yet, uh, but I hope to be able to do that in the future. And then we have music and sound. Uh, we're using the MaxMod library for this, which makes it really easy. Uh, I've added a helper function to Trick, which relies on the MaxMod utility program for most of the heavy lifting. But the way that you use this is to tell it where to find your WAV files and XM music files, and it outputs a sound bank that you can pass to MaxMod during initialization. And then I've put at the bottom some examples of how we actually play sounds in our game. And yeah, MaxMod makes it really straightforward. Finally, there's a good chance that we'll want to print some debug messages at some point during development. And so for that, we have a module that allows you to send formatted strings to the MGBA emulator. Of course, I'm not the one behind the string formatting routine or the protocol for sending messages to the emulator. Uh, shout outs to Dan Poslans and Endrif for all that hard work. But yeah, I'm just showing all this off because I think it's really useful. And so that just about wraps everything up. Um, if I've somehow piqued your interest in Game Boy Advance development, uh, you can check out these places. Uh, the GB Dev community has a, a GBA channel in its Discord, which is fairly active. And then the GBA Dev and DevKit Pro websites both have forums that you can ask for help on as well. If you want to learn more about NIM, uh, check out nimlang.org. And we've got links there for the IRC channel and Discord and various resources for you to learn all about the language. And finally, if you're interested in our game and want to see how that's coming along, you can follow me or Rick on Twitter. Uh, probably best off following Rick because he posts more updates than me. Um, but yeah, that's about everything. Uh, so thanks for watching everyone and have a nice day.